What I'm talking today about is, um, I'll do that first, I think, is really um, there's a big push in the UK to, uh, to share data between government organisations at least, not really between commercial organisations in government so much, but, uh, but certainly within government. Uh, and, uh, and the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency are really one of the, one of the, the, the forward thinking uh, leaders in this. Um, and this is really, or the results, what I'm going to show you today is the results of probably the first survey that was done like it, or certainly one of the first or second survey. Um, and as, a, as someone who has to go out and, uh, and, and sell the company and, uh, and get work to make the money out of these uh, sonars that we have, um, the more things we can do with one system, the better, and the more, the more agencies and the more government departments we can feed in, the better. And as a taxpayer in the UK, that's also quite a good thing to get more money out of, uh, out of my tax as well. So, uh, so that's sort of the reason, rationale behind it. Now, uh, uh, Net Survey and um, an MMT uh, joined forces uh, about a year ago now to create the uh, MMT group. Uh, so Net Survey is the UK office, and MMT is the Swedish office. Um, and we're still privately uh, owned. We currently have about 200 um, marine personnel, surveyors and uh, a marine crew. Uh, we have five vessels, at least six vessels actually. Uh, four ROVs, one ROTV, um, and a whole bunch of different kit from different uh, sonar manufacturers and, uh, and peripheral sensors. Um, and as an air survey, um, we were the first company to use a 7125 for charting. Um, this was um, when we had a contract for the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency on their ETV vessel, and we sort of had uh, sonar number one almost on the commercial side anyway. Um, that was painful. Um, and, then, um, and then, but we, didn't, we weren't disheartened. You know, they kept getting it better and better until it, until it worked. And uh, so we decided when the SV came out, we were the first company to purchase the uh, 7125 SV. In fact, we purchased two because we loved the company so much. Um, and what we specialise in is, uh, is high-resolution um, seabed mapping, um, or basically high-resolution surveys generally, and we're starting to go out the water a bit now. Um, and we're UK-based, um, but we operate worldwide. And it's the same with uh, uh, MMT in Sweden. We operate on a, on a worldwide basis. Um, and uh, I was going to go through those ones, but uh, it's easier to show our where we work and who we work for. And, and if you like, for some surveys, you can do exactly the same survey for exactly the same client, or oh, not exactly the same survey, for all these different clients with a subtle difference on the part of the deliverable. So most of them are high resolution seabed mapping. You might also have size counts, so bottom, whether it's ROV based, AUV based, uh, vessel based, doesn't really matter. It's the same systems. Um, you know, and what we do is collect high resolution data, and high resolution data is, you know, you've seen from, uh, from Martin just now. Um, with the wind farm surveys, they need it to monitor their scour. Of course, with the hydrographic surveys with David before, um, it's for, for all the wrecks and stuff. Um, and, and generally, that's yes, there. So the, the surveys can be, you know, cover a multitude of, of sins. This particular one started life as one for uh, Channel Coastal Observatory, which is uh, uh, an organisation based in Southampton at the National Oceanographic Centre. And they monitor the coastline around the UK. And... Um, uh, we did a survey for them back in 2007, uh, which was their first multi-beam one, and since then they wanted to do multi-beam everywhere, which is nice. Um, and to give them a bit more money, um, the MCA at the time joined, uh, well they still do, um, gave some of the civil hydrographic program money to them as well to make it a bigger, more encompassing survey, and to get, a, and get the MCA uh, survey specification involved here as well. So we have two different clients initially. Uh, Channel Coast Observatory monitoring the coast, so they want the data in ordnance datum, which is our land datum, they want it in ordnance datum vertically as well, and, um, and they also want long profiles and one metre uh, grids or better. Of course, MCA, data goes to UKHO for verification, they need latitude longitude, uh, and they need chart datum, um, they need all the soundings and the edited, the raw and the edited, tidal and geodetic observations, reporter survey, uh, the whole nine hours, and 100% coverage uh, to two metres, uh, to the two metre contour. Um, we actually were going closer in because for Channel Coast Observatory we had to go to mean high water Neeps, which is quite a long way up the beach, and, uh, and out to one kilometre. Now, 
that was the initial plan, and then sort of Canterbury Council got involved because it was their sort of area of, uh, of the coast, uh, so they, they needed a few extra bits and pieces. Then Kent Wildlife Trust said, oh, whilst you're there, can you just extend it out here a little bit? Uh, port of Dover said, well, we'll give you free port fees if you survey our port and our walls and our spill ground. So we said, well, that's a bit pushing it a little bit, but, uh, but yeah, and Port of Ramsgate said, yeah, we'll do the same if you, uh, if you survey our port as well. So it's like, okay. Uh, and that's Wessex Archaeology and had, uh, had some of the data to have a look at on the, for, for the wreck stuff, because this is, uh, the area we're involved with is, uh, is here. This is uh, uh, Dover, Dover Straits here. You've got the White Cliffs either side of here. Um, you've got Deal, which is where the Romans landed. Um, we did a survey out here and David said 400 wrecks. We, the, we knew there were 250, we found 400 extra wrecks uh, because this is uh, Battle of Britain territory over here um, and a pretty even collection of uh, German planes and British planes and vessels as well, so there's no nationality bias here at all. Uh, so initially it's just this one kilometre strip all the way down, uh, then we got extended out here, extended out here, extended out here and this bit out here for Kent. Uh, wildlife Trust, and then within the port itself. So uh, it's about uh, two, two to three months of, uh, two and a half months of uh, data gathering. Um, this is the, uh, the setup we had. Uh, we did it on a vessel of opportunity. Um, uh, we've used the vessel quite a few times uh, since then because it's been quite a stable boat. Uh, we did a dual head, 7125. So we had one on here, but then we had one over here. They're angled at 10 degrees out so that we reckoned the minimum we really wanted to go to underneath the keel was two metres. Um, so we were had coverage at two metres, you know, we basically covered ourselves. If we had them uh, more than 10 metres, uh, 10 degrees going out, then we would have had a gap in the data and it would have been like using an interferometric system, which gives me shivers. And, um, and then we had a Planix Pos MV on here um, with a Trimble, have a VRS network, which is a real-time RTK network, which is sort of redundant because we do all our uh, post-processing of our inertial data in the, with the Planix's uh, Pulsepack software. Uh, we're using Quincy uh, for acquisition and some processing and Flader Mouse for the majority of the, uh, of the data processing. Oops, oh, I'm doing what, uh, what Martin did, sorry about that. So the weather at times was okay, the weather at times wasn't so good. This is just uh, when we were trying to finish off the day. This was meant to be the calmest point of, uh, of where we were. We were still just about surveying here. And then it just got a little bit too, too mucky. And then in the moments, it's like we almost become a submarine. So it's uh, back. Yeah, so. Yeah, so that was, all, all, I just managed to stay on the seat during that particular little video footage. So the guys were up against it a lot. Um, Davy wasn't on board, so sickness wasn't an issue. <laughs> uh, one of the nice things with the 7125 SV um, is that you can have the, the same processing, you have the, the acquisition software on the same computer that you process with. Now other manufacturers say oh, you can run on a laptop, but personally I wouldn't want to run anything on a laptop in that sort of condition. Um, and you need hard, fast hard drive access as well. So these are four screens, we have the dual 7125, so we have one here and one here. Uh, basically these three are running off one computer plus a helmsman, and, uh, and this is a separate one for the, uh, for the port one. The two are linked together on Ethernet, and uh, you do things on this one, and it does, does things on that one. So uh, screen real estate is obviously good. This is our custom mount, because we had to move it out 10 degrees, so it's not your bog standard. Uh, and this is, the S, this is the SV2, but this is version one of the SV2, so we've now got the, the 200, 400, and the, and the proper reson mount, but this is our um, Heath Robinson out to 10 degrees, worked very well. Uh, and this isn't the boat, this is in the Bahamas, but it's an example of how we have things set up for easy deployment, apart from that's about to fall out, but that was during the mobilisation. So, uh, so this is our 19-inch rack portable unit that we can uh, take anywhere, very robust. And then and this is nice on the POS MV, we have a nice baseline um, over here. And because we've got the two, uh, the two trans, uh, true transponders, um, um, multi-beam heads here on the other side, uh, in the software, we, we take everything to the IMU, but then we project from the POS um, to both of these ones, so we have a, uh, a sensor one and a sensor two on this, which gets a bit interesting. When you have a dual head system, you have a lot of cables. Nothing like a big EM710 or Reson 7150 or whatever, because that would be a huge amount of cables. And uh, the charting deliverables uh, is what we have to do as the main one. 
Um, we're collecting upwards of 90 gigabytes of data a day. Um, that's a dual head system in shallow water pinging at 30 odd hertz. That's a lot. Um, in addition, we record a water column on some of the wrecks. Not that we had to then, uh, but because we thought we'd better get used to it, because we were going to have to do it. So the final deliverable was about five terabytes. Um, and, uh, and data is something that, uh, that companies sort of think about as an aside, and I would suggest that everyone thinks about it a lot more than that. Um, I mean, between the, Swed the Gothenburg office and our office, we have, we're talking in petabytes now, so we're almost up to a petabyte of data. Um, and it continues to grow. And interac interacting with this amount of data is a real issue. And if your normal IT department is used to dealing with Microsoft Office, it's not going to work. So, uh, so yeah, start thinking about data storage and accessing it. Full data density, report survey, rec forms, sound velocity, and lots of notice to mariners. And this is the standard. So it's minimum is nine soundings uh, per, per object, which is in a two meter bin. That's easily achievable when you're doing 90 gigabytes of data. However, one of the problems we did have with the dual system is the fact that it doesn't do simultaneous pinging. So you go ping on one head, you do ping on the other head. You get to 15 meters of water, you're slowing your vessel right down to enable you to meet that specification. This, I'll come back to that later. Uh, we use VORF, so we're doing everything on the ellipse side, and VORF is a vertical offshore reference frame uh, developed by uh, University College London and funded by the UKHO, which is like a geoid model which is bent down to chart datum. Uh, so we get different surfaces, so we have a chart datum surface, an LAT, mean low seawater, and most importantly for this one, we have the link between the land datum and, and chart datum. And so we have a surface for uh, land datum and a surface for chart datum, so we can produce the deliverables on both vertical reference frames. And that's just a graphic of what VORF looks like. Just a little plug for it. But we can't just use it, we have to validate it because UKHO give it to us and say, see if it works. And it always does work, but we still have to validate it. So that's just a graph of showing the, the R GNSS solution compared with the uh, tide gauge at Dover, which is handy, and then the online one as well. So, uh, so the online one here peaks. This is the difference between post-processing your data and using RTK in real time. RTK will A, fall, up, fall over, and it will also peak. Whereas if you do the post-process solution, it's not an issue. So we get a nice, beautiful seabed, lots of wrecks. This is not doing uh, water column over all of them. We weren't doing wreck investigations over all of them. Uh, but you pick up just about everything. We drape the charts to make sure that, okay, yeah, there is a wreck, there is a wreck. There, yeah. So that these wrecks have actually been picked up, which is, which is good. If there was a, a wreck without a wreck symbol, then you immediately know that you're looking about a new wreck and not one that's on the chart. Uh, and then these are just bog standard images taken from the normal survey. So not a wreck survey, just going over with a couple of lines of data um, in the normal overlap um, that you do. Uh, we collected the water column, so this is using the Flader Mass FM Midwater tool. Um, and uh, I would say to um, water column data is great for detecting the top of the, the wreck, but don't ever use it for visualizing a wreck because the whole point of beamforming is you get rid of all the noise in the sonar. And, uh, and if you do rec stuff, you get the noise in the sonar. So you're not going to get a better product by doing water column in terms of visualization. You're going to get a much better, well, a more reliable product over the, over the, uh, the, 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 the mast, but that's, that's, um, that's all. Um, coastal monitoring was the uh, one meter DTM and profiles in an art database. Uh, this is not really, for, this is Dover, but this is just to show you can go online and you can download all this LIDAR data for all the also corrected photos where you can actually download um, all the BATI data as well. You can actually download it in a Fladermouse scene file if you really want. Um, so that's just uh, what, what CCO do. They collect all this data and then analyze it. And this is just to show you how far up the beach we go. This is a LIDAR data. This is the White Cliffs in the shade of grey. Um, and, um, and this is our, our chalk reefs and this is the chalk from the, uh, from the LIDAR data uh, next to it. So, uh, so we're getting pretty, pretty close into the, uh, to, the, to the edge there. And then we needed to do habitat stuff from it as well. So this is now not bathy, this is backscatter, but you need good bathy to do good backscatter. Um, and this is, uh, this is one, of the, one of my bones of contention for reason as well at the moment. It's getting there, but the, uh, the acoustic response curves aren't there yet. Uh, this is actually from another survey because there are so many issues that uh, logging data at various stages and trying to get data out, it's very frustrating. Um, it does work, but I just didn't have time to work it for, for this particular one. And the chalk reefs, and then you can do things like rugosity, and I was interested to, 
listened to the presentation this morning about adding all these things together to do the habitat map, and uh, that, was, that was very interesting. And then they actually went and uh, produced a, a report on this. So they had a, backs a batty page. They had a not very good backscatter one. Well, it's actually done with the NOC uh, backscatter tools. Um, but then they developed um, uh, a UNIS uh, level three habitat map for it. Um, and also a, uh, uh, and a substrate type and the UNIS level one as well. So these are all data that we actually didn't do any of this, but we just provided them with the data for, for other people to do it. But we can do it for this. It just wasn't in the, uh, in the contract. Um, and then the port deliverables was not really a deliverable, we just told them they wanted a chart of the port, so they got a chart of the port with all the selected soundings and things. And then they hassled us to get this because the UKHO was going to produce a new uh, chart for Dover, so we had to get the data in, which was fine, we did it. Um, and we had a few logistical issues, this is Dover port, this is the cross-channel ferry that goes from Dover to France, and there's a few of them, and they go very often. And, um, and you, know, you couldn't really do a diver inspection in here at all because A, the divers would get sucked up to these thrusters, and which is not a bad thing sometimes, but then the, um, uh, but you just couldn't, you, you'd take an entire uh, key out of operation and that's not what they wanted. Um, and some of the things that we found were this is meant to be a nine meter maintained depth. Uh, this is areas that aren't nine meters, obviously. This is up to about seven and a half, I think they got in this area here. And that's just by taking a chart and putting a chart in at nine meters down and seeing what's above it. So uh, that was a bit of an eye opener for them. Um, I mean, they've done stuff around, I mean, they've got a pretty good control. I mean, uh, Port of London do a lot of the surveys down here over by the, uh, um, by the actual main uh, ferry terminal part, so, uh, so that was interesting. But this one, yeah, their dredges aren't particularly good. Uh, and then we sort of work up the data. So then we're finding, this is one of the, um, uh, the cross-channel ferry ports, and there's various features in here, and some of them in particular, this one here I think it was, was supposed to be a block that was dropped which was basically stopping the deeper ones coming in because they weren't sure what depth it was, but we found that actually the depth was less than they thought it, or deeper than they thought it was, so that was okay. These are all the other different features uh, that we found. Uh, we then put them together into a report with an analysis of what we thought they were, just to give the divers, because then if they wanted to go and dive on it, they could. Um, and then this is something that we've, um, we've done this in, um, this sort of development in conjunction with Port of London, and I'm not going to go on about it because I know John's presentation's got quite a bit of it in. But this is just one of the key walls, and with a showing collapse in the key wall, and then we can measure how deep that collapse actually is in the, uh, in the side of the wall. Uh, and that's just by tilting the head and, um, and, and making the uh, changing from an easting, northing, and depth to a distance along, a distance out, and a distance down, and you can then grid the distance out. Uh, some of the archaeology, I'm not an archaeologist at all, I'm a surveyor, but, um, but this was a nice, and, and, and this was, oh, let's go back one, hang on a second. Oh, I get, oh, I'm going the wrong way now, I'm doing design. Let me, let me go back the other way. I thought there was another one after this, because there's a few that were sunk into the mud as well, and these look wooden to me anyway, and they're just off deal, um, <laughs> so they're old. Um, but it'd be interesting to, uh, to, and they're very close to the shore as well. So, and there were quite a few of them, so it'd be interesting. They might just be little Thames or whatever scuttles, but you never know. Um, and then this isn't really the same one, but this is a survey with the same boat, with the same echo sanders and exactly the same setup. Um, so, and this is the, we did the survey um, in uh, November. This is the Royal Oak up in, uh, up in Scapa Flow with the 7125 this time, and um, with the tilted head at 10 degrees on one side, and we kept one side flat as well. So you get fantastic def uh, uh, detail out of, the, uh, out of the sonars now. You can take pictures of that. Um, and just to, this is, um, we're, we're now just, this isn't really multi-beam stuff, but this is laser stuff. Um, and we thought, okay, well, we're doing a survey of the, of the uh, port, so we'll stick a laser on as well to get, because we're all doing the key walls, and we thought, okay, well, let's see if we can go above the key wall. Uh, so this is the Aplanix landmark system that we have. Um, and um, it's, it's not particularly weatherproof at the moment, which is, I mean, it's a beautiful day, but it's not particularly weatherproof. Um, and then this is an example. This is the cliffs from the boat. So this is collected at the same time as we collected the Bathy data. So that you're looking, at, and this is at low tide, so the idea is we get an overlap between the laser and the, um, and the, and the, uh, and the, and the bathymetry here as well. So. In conclusion, the 7125 SV has been really flexible for us. Um, we can pretty much achieve anything that we want to throw at it. Uh, the quality of the data, 
is exceptional from the 7125 SV. It's, you know, we've used other sonars, um, and this is by far and away the best one that we have for doing, for doing wrecks especially, and, and construction engineering sort of stuff. Um, the running the acquisition software in the same computer is pretty good too. Um, and on this one, all the products came from, uh, from Flader Mouse. Um, as everyone's doing, let's, let's put our wish list down. Uh, simultaneous pinging uh, was really killing us on, uh, on this job. And uh, so I put simultaneous dual head current 7125 SV. I don't want to buy another one to get simultaneous dual head pinging. Um, I want correct angular response curve so I can do a better job on the backscatter. And I want multiple pings, so even then I can do simultaneous ping and I can go twice as fast, or at least a quarter as fast. And on the water column stuff, it was, um, I think David was mentioning this, I think um, uh, it would be really good to have li li uh, laser scanners do uh, multiple detects. So like, you know, you're flying over the top of a forest, you the first detects your top of your canopy, a few detects down, the bottom one is the... Uh, uh, is, the, is the earth. So if you're look, doing looking bare earth models, you go for the last return all the time. It would be really useful to have that sort of capability in a ping or in a beam. So rather than necessarily having the water column data and having to process all of that, if you could choose first return going over X, that would probably uh, make life a lot easier. So, uh, and uh, that's me. <laughs>